I'm not in the least frightened of, of my intellectual enemies, but they're very frightened of me. I was in Germany, and one of my colleagues said, in no sense of malice, he said, tell me, Dr. Hillman, do people in Britain hate you as much as they do in Germany? My name is Harold Hillman. I write boring books which nobody wants to publish and nobody wants to review and nobody wants to read, but I still go on publishing them. I was a founder member of Amnesty International. I have degrees in medicine, in physiology and in biochemistry. If you study the endoplasmic reticulum, which is an artifact, you're simply wasting your time. The Golgi body, the unit membrane, the cytoplasm, all these are artifacts. If you address it, you can't get out of it, and most people therefore don't want to address it. Histology and electron microscopy cannot give information about the living cell. Cells were first described by the English microscopist Robert Hooke in 1665. Here we see his illustration of cork with cells, which he described as filled with juices and by degrees sweating them out. In 1781, Fontana in Italy described in these slime cells from the eel an oval body furnished with a spot in the middle. This spot is generally taken as the first description of the nucleolus, although he did not draw it. The term nucleus was coined by Robert Brown. In 1838, Schleiden published his classical work, Contributions to Phytogenesis, and some cells which he called cytoblasts and sporules can be seen in this illustration. It's obvious that the membrane, the nuclei and nucleoli, had been clearly recognized by the middle of the 19th century. Although Corti, in 1774, was the first to describe streaming, the fine arrows in this potato hair cell of Schleiden's are probably the first illustration of streaming in the literature. In 1890, Altman, whose frog liver cells are seen here, gave the name Altman's granules to what we now call mitochondria. Towards the end of the 19th century, there was much discussion about whether fibrils in the cytoplasm were artifacts or not. In Italy, Golgi detected the Golgi body with his newly developed silver stain. In Golgi's original illustration, it can be seen permeating throughout the cytoplasm. This view from a paper of Holmgren in 1902 also shows the Golgi apparatus distributed rather differently in the cytoplasm, that is, in the area around the nucleus. The next structure seen by the light microscope was the nucleolonema, detected by Estebel and Sotillo in Uruguay in 1950. They gave this name to the fine fibrillar structure apparent within the nucleolus. Recently, under light microscopy, a nucleolar membrane was seen in all neurons examined from frog, guinea pig, rabbit and rat. An easily detected by phase contrast microscopy, it has now also been seen with magnifications as low as 200 times with bright field, dark brown, interference, polarizing, and an optical microscopy. However, the cells must be dissected out in saline in order to see it. It is not known whether the membrane appears around the nucleoli of cells other than neurons. The electron microscope, which was applied to the study of biological tissues in the 1940s, permits magnifications two to three orders greater than is possible by light microscopy. As a result of observations of tissues with this greater magnification, a number of new structures were seen. These are illustrated in this plasma cell from Blumenforsitz 
classical textbook of histology. The new structures are the endoplasmic reticulum, first seen by Porter, Claude and Fulham, the nuclear pores by Callan and Tomlin, and the unit membrane by Robertson. The existence of the Golgi body, about which there had been much controversy up to the middle 1950s, was regarded as having been proved when it was seen on electron microscopy as in this typical picture of Toner and Carr. Christie was seen for the first time in mitochondria. This well-known diagram by Brachet of a generalized cell is one of two which appeared in the Scientific American and have been widely reproduced in textbooks. In it, the following features can be seen. Within the cytoplasm, there is a Golgi body and an extensive endoplasmic reticulum which is connected to the extracellular space and to the nucleus. Pores are present in the nuclear membrane. Here is the other diagram by Robertson. It shares all the features of the Brachet cell, but in this one the membranes all appear as double lines, and therefore there are cisterni between them. Both diagrams are intended to show the living cell, and both are regarded as being representative of plant as well as of animal cells. Let us now have a look at some of the features of living cells. Streaming in plant cells is often one of the first features to be observed under the microscope by biology students. It can be seen here at low magnification and in real time. In mammalian tissue cultures, it is possible to see several kinds of intracellular movement. Phagocytosis, here speeded up 96 times, is occurring in a macrophage. Large particles are engulfed by the cell and move around the cytoplasm in vacuoles. Brownian movement of bacteria can be seen in the cytoplasm. Pinocytosis is a similar process. There is a small active cell in the upper half of the field, but we are interested in the large chick embryo cell occupying most of the lower two-thirds of the screen. Vacuoles of fluid are engulfed, particularly near the arrow, and can be seen moving in the cytoplasm. This sequence is speeded up 48 times. Continuous movement of mitochondria is also a feature of the living cell, seen very clearly in this time-lapse film. Brownian movement of small particles is also seen here. Nuclear rotation is illustrated by this cell from a culture of rat hearts speeded up 48 times. The complete list of intracellular movements includes diffusion of injected particles, Brownian movement, phagocytosis, pinocytosis, movements of mitochondria, formation of vacuoles and their disappearance, and nuclear rotation. These can be seen in living plant cells, protozoa, or cells in tissue culture and are the main criteria by which one judges whether the cells are alive. When intracellular movements stop, the cells are dead. The purpose of this film is to arrive at the real structure of the living cell. We shall examine the generally accepted structure seen by electron microscopy in the light of what is known about, firstly, the properties of the living cell, which we have just demonstrated, secondly, the limitations of solid geometry, and thirdly, the physical properties of materials.
Let us consider the endoplasmic reticulum. The first question that arises is, how is it possible for the intracellular movements which we have seen in living cells under relatively low power light microscopy to occur if there are indeed a three-dimensional net which requires a hundred to a thousand times greater magnification to see and, according to modern textbooks, is attached to the cell membrane and to the nuclear membrane. This point is illustrated by examination of some intracellular dimensions. The distance between the strands of the reticulum in a number of preparations varies between 800 and 2,000 angstrom units, but mitochondria, which appear at least 5,000 angstrom units wide, are seen to move freely, and particles up to 50,000 angstroms can be seen in Brownian motion. Of course, the reticulum does not completely fill up the cytoplasm, but the rate of streaming and Brownian movement would be determined by the narrowest space between the reticulum and the cell membrane, which would act as a bottleneck. The next question is, how is the reticulum attached to the cell membrane? According to the widely accepted unit membrane concept of Robertson, on electron microscopy, the cell membrane and the endoplasmic reticulum both appear as two lines with a narrow space between them. If the two layers of the cell membrane invaginate to form the reticulum, as Robertson has suggested, the reticulum should always appear as four lines, or cisternae should always be seen when the reticulum is present. This would give us one model of the attachment of the reticulum to the cell membrane. There are two other possible models. Each layer of the reticulum could be attached to the inner layer of the cell membrane, and the outer layer would be imperforate. This is occasionally seen, but would necessarily mean that the extracellular space could not be continuous with the channel in the reticulum. Alternatively, the lumen of the reticulum could make a hole or cleft between both of the two lines of the unit membrane. Thus, one could see holes in the cell membrane at the edge of which the two lines would stop abruptly. Unfortunately, the latter appearances seem not to have been seen on electron micrographs at all, and the cisternae associated with the first model are difficult to find. Indeed, in an extensive examination of the literature, one rarely comes across electron micrographs, as opposed to diagrams, showing the point of attachment of the endoplasmic reticulum to the cell membrane. Our next difficult question is, what is the geometry of the reticulum, and indeed all other unit membranes? This model represents a unit membrane. Let us say that it has a total thickness in life of 150 angstrom units. We can cut transverse and oblique sections. As the sections become more and more oblique, the two lines of the unit membrane will appear farther apart. So, we would expect to see a range of distances between the two layers of a unit membrane of a particular thickness, depending upon the obliqueness of the section. It would be impossible that the unit membrane would always appear to have a constant thickness. In the present context, this applies to the cell membrane, the mitochondrial membranes, the Christi of the mitochondria, and the lamellae of the Golgi body. But it is also a serious question in relation to the myelin sheath, the synaptic cleft, and the lamellae of the chloroplast. It would be quite inconceivable that all electron microscopists always cut perfect transverse sections of all subcellular organelles, which all happen to be concentrically orientated simultaneously. All the structures in these three adjacent cells could scarcely be expected to have been in the same orientation at the time of cutting the section. It is equally surprising that in the literature the distances between the two lines of the unit membrane, the nuclear membrane and the Christi are normally given in a particular tissue as one figure without a range. Electron microscopists have two views on the form in three dimensions of the endoplasmic reticulum. According to one view, the endoplasmic reticulum consists of flattened vesicles or sheets. If we look at it in transverse section, 
we see the traditional equally spaced parallel lines with a few connecting walls. In this orientation, we see a solid sheet of tissue wider than the distance between the sheets. It should be noticed that in this orientation, the underlying sheets must appear closer together than they do in the original transverse section. The second structure proposed for the endoplasmic reticulum is of a real net, as the name implies. Looking from above at this model, we see the strands of the reticulum in several planes. In different orientations, we get a further series of geometrical patterns. Nevertheless, on transverse section, it will appear again as equally spaced parallel lines, although connecting strands will also be seen. Unfortunately, shapes other than the well-known parallel lines are hardly ever seen. We may summarize these geometrical arguments by saying that the endoplasmic reticulum is hardly ever seen as a section of a possible three-dimensional structure. It exists only in the two dimensions of the picture. In this respect, the endoplasmic reticulum should be contrasted with the whole mitochondria and the muscle filaments, which do appear as three-dimensional structures on electron micrographs. Put another way, it would be quite impossible to construct a three-dimensional model of a whole cell based on an electron micrograph, which would allow the currently accepted intracellular movements to occur. Let us now look at another structure seen by electron microscopy, the nuclear pore. Nuclear pores were originally noted as complete gaps in the nuclear membrane, appearing as circles on tangential sections as Franke and Scheer have photographed them, or as slits as seen in this typical picture. More recently, they have been described as being closed by a diaphragm or fenestration. Elaborate drawings have been made, like this one of thread goals. Note that his pore diameter is between 500 and 520 angstrom units. Pore diameters in the literature vary from a maximum of 1,000 angstrom units in rat cerebellar cells to a minimum of 200 angstroms in mouse pancreatic asthma cells. More recently, smaller values have been cited since the description of a nuclear pore apparatus. Let us now look at the size of some ions and molecules found to be either side of the nuclear membrane. Their diameters do not exceed 59 angstrom units for chlorophyll, but molecules less than 10,000 molecular weight are less than 35 angstroms wide. How could such large pores prevent the ingress of such small ions or particles? Furthermore, the pores are said to occupy between 3 and 32 percent of the surface of the nuclear membrane and it would require a phenomenal amount of energy to prevent molecules leaking through such a relatively large area of holes. Bernstein and his colleagues have reported that there are potential differences across nuclear membranes of nearly all the nuclei they have examined. Would not such potential differences be short-circuited by these holes? One may also ask how nuclear rotation could occur if the layers of the nuclear membrane were riveted by the nuclear pore apparatus shown in Threadgold's diagram. This diagram also illustrates a geometrical difficulty related to nuclear pores. We have seen them on electron micrographs as slits or circles. Why do they never appear oval? They should sometimes look like indentations on a golf ball as illustrated here. A further difficulty arises when we consider a section of a hole in the membrane. Here we see a model of a pore face on. This is the width of the section. It is quite evident that the pore cannot be seen in transverse section if the diameter is less than the thickness of the section. This is true even if the section cuts one face of the pore. Only if the pore has a larger diameter than the thickness of the section and is cut both posteriorly and anteriorly by it will it be seen at all. 
the size of the paw will apparently be that of the smallest gap. Obviously, the size of the gap appears will depend on where the hole is in the section. Therefore, we should not expect to see a constant pore size. The circular shape of the pores on plan view leads us to suggest that they are bubbles, and on transverse section they represent cracks in the nuclear membrane. At this point, it would be useful to put forward our suggestions about how the endoplasmic reticulum, the unit membrane, and the nuclear pore originate during preparation for electron microscopy. If we look at this illustration from Wheatley's Introduction to Electron Microscopy, we see a section unstained on the left and stained with heavy metals on the right. Obviously, the image the electron microscopist sees is composed only of heavy metal. Furthermore, the two-dimensional appearance of the structures we have been discussing gives us a clue as to their genesis. That is, they must be formed after the sections have been cut. A geometrical line is a fiction because it has position but no thickness. Any real layer has two surfaces. This layer represents a real membrane. Heavy metals like osmium, tungsten and lead are deposited on surfaces of such membranes for electron microscopy. And as we see here, the membrane appears as two parallel lines of heavy metal. Thus, any stain which is a deposit like a heavy metal will never permit us to see a real membrane as one line. This point applies equally to freezing techniques. Although freezing is used for fixation, heavy metals are also used for seeing the tissue. When a tissue is prepared for the electron microscope, it contains some embedding medium, some heavy metal, and possibly some tissue. Each of these three components is grossly different with respect to its coefficient of expansion, heat conductivity, affinity for metal, electron density, stability, vapor pressure, and compressibility. Let us now look at one of these, the temperature coefficient. The figure for osmium is approximately one-tenth of that of the epoxy resins, and the temperature inside the electron microscope specimen has been measured and is several hundred degrees. Therefore, the tissue, the metal and the embedding medium, with their vastly different coefficients of expansion, will explode if rapidly heated to high temperature, as does a piece of clay in a potter's oven if it contains air bubbles. There is no doubt that, on electron micrographs, one can see the appearance of an endoplasmic reticulum in the cytoplasm of most cells. So that, if one believes it to be an artifact, one should be able to explain it. We can describe the cytoplasm in the living cell as an aqueous suspension containing, among other constituents, salts, amino acids, fatty acids, and many metabolites soluble in water. When the tissue is dehydrated and organic solvents are added for electron microscopy, these solutes must precipitate and insoluble particles will deposit. The distinguished cryobiologist Luye and his school in Madison have shown the beautiful patterns which may be obtained when various solutions are frozen and then viewed with the electron microscope. These are the patterns made by freezing salts, and these made by freezing amino acids and glycerol. When freezing to below minus 50 degrees occurs, ice crystallizes out and the solute precipitate. However, it is most significant that the particular pattern found depends upon the rate of freezing, the nature of the solutes, the purity of the constituents, and their relative and total concentrations. It is of particular interest that careful examination of their precipitates by electron microscopy often reveals the two-line thick appearance, and these two lines appear to be of a remarkably uniform distance apart. Is this a model for the unit membrane? Finally, let us go back to an intracellular structure that predates the electron microscope. The Golgi apparatus appeared to Golgi as a uniform net distributed within the cytoplasm. To later light microscopists like Born, it appeared as a paranuclear mass of about the same total diameter as that of the nucleus, 
and to home grain it was a shell of granules spherically distributed around the nucleus. The controversy as to whether the Golgi apparatus was real or was a fixation or staining artifact was considered to have been settled when the body was seen by the electron microscope. This is a typical picture of its lamella structure and its appearance at this magnification is extremely uniform throughout all tissues. However, when we compare the appearance and dimensions of the Golgi apparatus, firstly as seen by Golgi, secondly by the later light microscopists, and thirdly by the electron microscopists, it becomes abundantly clear that they were looking at quite different objects. For example, Golgi's network looks nothing like the electron microscopist's onion-like lamellar structure. The paranuclear Golgi apparatus is never less than 8 to 10 microns in diameter, but the electron microscopist is never more than 2 microns. Although early phase contrast microscopists like Ludford claim to have seen the Golgi apparatus in unstained preparations, it must have been several orders larger than the lamellar structure seen by the electron microscopists. We can now reconsider the structure of the living cell in the light of the present discussion after having shaved off unnecessary hypotheses by the unsparing use of Occam's razor. All intracellular structures are moving continuously and at different speeds. If we were to stop this movement and draw the generalized cell, it would look like this diagram. The membranes around the cell, the nucleus, the mitochondria and probably the nucleolus are of single thickness and are imperforate. There is no endoplasmic reticulum or Golgi apparatus. The lysosomes have not been considered in this discussion. The nucleolonema is present in the nucleolus. Unhappily, it is a picture remarkably like that which had been revealed by the 1890s with the sole exception of the further detail of the nucleolus. The lessons that come out of these considerations are firstly that we should always assess the validity of any structural findings in cells by their compatibility with observations on living tissue and secondly that we should pay much more attention to the possible, indeed probable, effects of our preparative techniques upon the appearance of cells. Since the 19th century, it has been known that staining for histology shrinks and distorts cells. We took advantage of the technique devised by the Swedish neurobiologist Holger Huden to dissect out by hand single medullary brain cells from rabbits. We photographed the same cells at each stage of three of the best known staining procedures used in neurohistology and pathology laboratories throughout the world. The standard procedures were, firstly, hematoxylin and eosin, secondly, palm grain silver stain, which is used for nervous tissue, and thirdly, glutaraldehyde fixation and osmic acid staining as used in transmission electron microscopy. Here we see the two unfixed cell bodies filling a large part of the screen. They are fixed with formalin and we have outlined the original cells to view this shrinkage. We will soon see the solution coming in from the left and the uh, shrinkage is gradual but quite perceptible. Although these photographs have been taken in real time, they have been edited to show the important points. Here we are focusing and we then proceed to the 70 to 100 percent ethanol to dehydrate the cells but this has been left out in the editing. Here we see the cells now in 100 percent ethanol being completely dehydrated and as we watch them we will next add the xylene
to replace the 100% ethanol. Refocusing. Refocusing again. Now we see the xylol, which replaces the ethanol and makes the cells rather difficult to see for a brief period. We have not embedded the cells in paraffin wax as is usual because they could not be seen in the wax and we could not withdraw it from the chamber. But we then proceed, therefore, from the xylene which we see here back to the ethanols from 100% down 70% back to an aqueous solution. Here we see the ethanol replacing the xylene. Once again, the shrinkage is considerable. We are refocusing. And the next stage consists of rehydration. And then we stain with hemotoxylin, which makes the cells go reddish. We have now changed from phase contrast microscopy to bright field illumination during the staining with hematoxylin. The hematoxylin is now being washed out and we will shortly see the staining with eosin. The wave of eosin is coming in from the left as the whole background goes orange. there is a precipitate formed which is gradually washed away from left to right. Now we are washing off the eosin and it is going away from right to left. A piece of debris stained with hematoxylin has arrived as we dehydrate the cells in ethanol and through xylol which we are editing out and finally we embed in DPX. We'll very shortly compare this appearance, please look very carefully, with the original appearance of the two same neurons. The palm grain procedure was then examined in a similar way. Here is another unfixed rabbit neuron. Once again, we add formal saline to fix the cell. Here you see it coming in from the left. And there is a slight shrinkage. The shrinkage is now almost complete and we proceed to dehydrate the cell by going through the ethanols up to a hundred percent ethanol. The contrast gets very poor at this stage and we add xylene and there is further shrinkage indicated by comparing the image seen now with the drawing on the surface of the original cell. Here we see the xylene now being replaced by a hundred percent ethanol again and we begin to rehydrate the cell again
to distilled water. It becomes clear that the cells do not reflate after the dehydration with ethanol. We then add silver nitrate as can be seen here and it makes the cell go grey-brown. The dendrites become much easier and clearer to see, but they're rather shrunk. We then wash off the silver nitrate and refocus the cell. Pyrogallol is added to reduce the silver nitrate. and that produces very little effect except ultimately to increase the contrast of the cell. and the gold chloride is added to tone it. Here we can see the gold spreading from right to left across the cell and it gives a slight bluish tint to the cell body. The cell is then dehydrated first with the alcohols up to 100%. The shrinkage continues. When the xylene is added there is a further considerable shrinkage and perturbation of the fluid around the cell which goes out of focus. There are several shots of us here trying to refocus it. We now add DPX to embed the cell body. and we can draw the outline of the cell as it now appears. This is compared with the original shape and dimensions of the same cell body. The shrinkage with palm grain stain in a number of cells turned out to be to about 20% of the original area of the, the same cell. Finally, let us look by phase contrast microscopy at the effect of osmic acid staining as is done for electron microscopy. Here is the unfixed cell. Now we add the fixative which is glutaraldehyde and you see a considerable shrinkage as a solution comes from the left side to the right side. The excess glutaraldehyde is washed off and you see the cacodylate buffer going from right to left. We then stain with 2% osmic acid 
and the cell body gradually becomes yellow. The cacodylate is used to wash off the excess osmic acid stain and we begin the process of dehydration. We start with 70% ethanol, 90% ethanol and 100% ethanol and at each stage there is more shrinkage and some movement of the cell body itself. The shrinkage jerks a bit. Next we add propylene oxide which makes the solution go cloudy and is to replace the 100% ethanol. There is considerable further shrinkage in this medium and this will require us shortly to refocus the cell body to see its maximum diameter again. We now embed in EPON and watch the cell in phase contrast and then we change the uh, microscopy to see it by bright field illumination. The cell body can be seen to continue to shrink and apparently move in the embedding in EPON due to the exchange of solutions. As before, we now compare this stained cell body with its original size and shape. With osmic acid staining, the shrinkage in a large number of cell bodies was to an average of only 14% of their original areas. We have analysed many such experiments and we have concluded that with all procedures the main shrinkages and distortions occur during three phases. These are firstly the fixation, secondly the dehydration and finally the embedding stages. These observations probably apply to fixation and dehydration in all histological and electron microscopical procedures. Histologists recognize two major cell types in the central nervous system. The electrically excitable neurons and the neuroglial cells, variously described as connective tissue cells, nutritive cells or phagocytes. The term neuroglia was coined by Virchow in the 1850s. In this original illustration of a section of the brain, he describes neuroglia as the material between the cells and regarded it as a glue holding the neurons together. Between the middle of the 19th and 20th centuries, staining systems, mostly using salts of the heavy metals, particularly silver, were developed by Golgi, Ramon Nicajal, Del Rio Ortega, and many others. These were used to characterize different kinds of cells in the central nervous system by light microscopy.
By the early 1920s, the currently accepted view had evolved that neuroglia was not a glue or a ground substance, but a tissue composed of three types of cell, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, and microglia. Each type requires specialized staining systems for them to be seen. Astrocytes, illustrated here with drawings by Penfield, have long fibrous processes, often ending on capillaries. Oligodendrocytes are pictured, again by Penfield, as slightly oval cells with fewer processes. Baumann and Bock used Rio del Hortega's stain to show a microglial cell, which is described as having a small dense nucleus and a slightly staining cytoplasm. It appears in different publications in many forms, but is generally considered to be phagocytic. It is interesting to note that in the literature, actual photomicrographs of neuroglial cells are much rarer than diagrams or drawings of these cells. In fact, the literature offers no universal agreement on the cellular structure of the central nervous system. For example, here are some adjectives from authoritative publications used to describe neurons. Similar publications describe oligodendrocytes thus, and microglia thus. Descriptions of astrocytes are very rare. Perhaps the main reason for a lack of an agreed histological view is that our knowledge of the brain is so fragmentary. But there are other more practical difficulties contributing to the confusion. And it is important in this context to look at three areas in some detail. These can be discussed under the following headings. Firstly, the appearance of a cell in any particular section depends mainly on the orientation of the cell in relation to the angle of the knife and the thickness of that section relative to the dimensions of the cell body. This can be demonstrated by considering the solid geometry of an egg as a model of a large cell body and its nucleus. We can cut slices of the egg with the same relative thickness as a neurohistologist uses in preparing sections for staining. Here we see three eggs of the same size that have been sectioned along three different axes, resulting in a large variety of two-dimensional sizes and shapes, despite the uniformity of the uncut eggs. The more asymmetrical the cell body, the more different kinds of appearances would be seen. Quite clearly, one cannot describe the size, presence or position of the nucleus, nucleolus or mitochondria, or their shapes, without cutting serial sections. This difficulty is compounded if we are looking at cells like neurons that have processes. How can we be sure of the numbers and positions of axons or dendrites? If we are to distinguish between cell types on the basis of appearance, then having a clear understanding of the three-dimensional structure is even more critical. In the case of the central nervous system, this point is illustrated by these beautiful drawings of Peters, Palais and Webster, showing neurons, an oligodendrocyte and an astrocyte. It is obvious that the external structure of the different cell types drawn by these distinguished neurohistologists would be interchangeable if any of these cells were rotated and viewed from a different angle. Secondly, any staining procedure alters cells considerably and distorts their organelles. These are two unfixed neurons isolated by hand dissection. You can see that they are fairly globular with large nuclei. Watch what happens as they are fixed and stained. This sequence was recorded in real time and then edited to reduce the overall running time on the screen. 
we may now compare the final appearance with the original appearance of the same cells. Thirdly, the different staining systems for the different kinds of cells are not as specific as is generally thought. This is especially true for neuroglial specific stains. This is a list of elements in the central nervous system. According to the authoritative literature, Cajal's gold sublimate shows up these elements. Del Rio Ortega's stain shows up these. Bilshovsky's, these. And Golgi Cox is described as staining all these, though mysteriously only shows up 2 to 5% of the neurons. Although most neurohistologists would agree on the identification of many cells on a particular slide, there might well be disagreement on some of the individual cells which could not be identified unequivocally. For example, phosphotungstic acid hematoxylin is said to stain astrocytes, but can we be certain whether these are neurons or astrocytes? Weil and Davenport stains microglia and oligodendroglia, but can we differentiate these two cell types here? We approach this question in another way. We cut five serial sections of recognizable parts of rat brain and stained each with one of five specific stains. We then looked for cells which appeared in adjacent sections. Watch the position of the cells arrowed in these photomicrographs of the sections stained with hematoxylin and eosin, Marsland, Glees and Ericsson, phosphotungstic acid hematoxylin, Weil and Davenport, and Gallias's stain. Having noted the number of cells appearing in adjacent sections over eight groups of serial sections, these are some of the figures, we calculated the percentages and found that for all observations the mean was 55%. That is, 55% of cells stained with one so-called specific stain showed up with another. Another demonstration of this lack of specificity is that those most easily identifiable of neurons, the Purkinje cells in the cerebellum, and the ventral horn cells in the spinal cord, show up with nearly all staining procedures. Here we see Purkinje cells stained by hematoxylin and eosin, chrysal violet, phosphotungstic acid hematoxylin, and palmgren stain. Another example, ventral motor neurons of the spinal cord stained with hematoxylin and eosin, Del Rio Ortega stain, Golgi's stain, and Cresal violet. All these experiments lead to the conclusion that virtually all procedures, both general and those believed to be specific for neuroglial cells, also stain neurons quite clearly. In addition, the major part of the tissue is not stained by any procedure. This is contrary to the general view that, were it possible to get one section of central nervous tissue to take up all specific stains, it would appear stained almost completely and solidly. Now, unfortunately, we cannot test this directly since one cannot stain one section with several different staining procedures and see if the addition of each, believed to be specific for each cell type, would gradually fill the whole section with a mosaic of colored cells. However, there are other indirect ways by which we can test the question as to whether there is any significant volume of the central nervous system not stained by all the staining procedures thought to be specific for neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes and microglia. We stain sections of frontal, parietal and occipital lobes, 
cerebellum and thoracic and lumbar spinal cords, with Marsland, Glees and Erickson stain for neurons in their processes, phosphotungstic acid hematoxylin for astrocytes, and violin Davenport for oligodendrocytes and microglia, as well as the more general stains, hematoxylin and eosin, patais and galliases. Using a quantimet counter, we measured separately the total areas stained by each of these staining procedures. As we have noticed before, each procedure stains structures which account for only a small percentage of the section. When we add up all the areas for these three stains, Marsland, Glees and Erickson, Phosphotungstic Acid Hematoxylin and Vial and Davenport, we should obtain a value for the total area of stained tissue, as if the same section had been stained with all the different cellular procedures at once. However, only about 20% of the brain is thus accounted for. The same is true for spinal grey matter. Therefore, one must conclude that most of the central nervous system consists of a substance which does not contain any of the elements shown up by these staining procedures, despite the general belief that virtually the whole volume of the central nervous system is filled up with neurons, astrocytes, oligodendrocytes, microglia and ependymal cells. For example, Windle, an authority on neuroglia, said, There is no ground substance in the central nervous system, except in the thin basement laminae of capillaries, and the few places where connective tissue penetrates. While Han, in his textbook of histology, tells us, In fact, there is no connective tissue space in the brain. Nauter and Fiertag, in an issue of Scientific American, devoted wholly to the brain, takes this further by stating, If all the neurons were stained, the tissue would appear black. The idea that the brain and spinal cord are solid with cells in their processes is generally believed to be supported by observations using electron microscopy. In this example, there appears to be only a small extracellular space between identifiable elements although one must hasten to add that this view is largely a circular argument. It starts with the belief that the brain is full of cells and their processes, and then describes the appearances between the neurons as that of the particular kinds of neuroglia. The missing point here is the demonstration by light microscopy, by which the neuroglia were originally and specifically described, that the central nervous system is indeed largely packed by neurons and neuroglia cells. Our quantimet experiment demonstrates that there is much space unaccounted for. We may then ask the question raised by Campbell in 1905. What is that terra incognita that remains over when cells, fibres and neuroglia are subtracted? We have to approach this indirectly by defining more accurately what neuroglia is. Looking at a section of the occipital lobe of the rat, stained with hematoxylin and eosin, we see that the brain contains blood vessels and their contents, which are common to all tissues. One can also see three cellular elements, neurons, labelled with a capital N, some larger, more spherical, paler cells, which are probably poorly stained neurons, labelled with a larger P, and neuroglial nuclei, shown by two small Ns. And, as we have demonstrated, when one examines a rat brain stained with an astrocytic stain, phosphotungstic acid hematoxylin, one sees the same three elements, neurons, rounder cells, and nuclei. The same elements are seen with the triple stain of pate, and the neural process stain of Marsland, Glees, and Erickson, Let us look more closely at these neuroglial nuclei. They seem suspended in a field of material which itself takes up very little stain. Perhaps, as has been suggested for oligodendrocytes and microglia, their nuclei have only thin rims of cytoplasm. We have seen the appearance of such rims, but we ascribe them to the effect of focusing through a thick section, 
as used with Golgi stains, as we see here. Obviously, the nuclei are not all seen in focus in one plane, so those out of focus in any particular plane appear to have a thin rim of cytoplasm around them. If this apparent rim is an artifact, where is the cytoplasm of these nuclei? We made up several slides, each with a section of kidney, liver and brain, and stained each slide with one of several specific stains. Hematoxylin and aircin showed the cell membranes around the kidney and the liver cells, but there is no evidence at all of any such membranes between the neurons and the microglial nuclei which predominate in the section of the brain. Similarly, phosphotungstic acid hematoxylin showed membranes around the kidney and liver cells, but none between the neurons and the nuclei in the brain. This was true for the remaining stains. Violin Davenport, Grisal Violet, Galliasis stain, Pate's triple stain, and Marsland Glees and Erickson's. We were therefore forced to the conclusion that the nuclei, which did not appear to be surrounded by identifiable rims of cytoplasm or by cell membranes, must be either an extremely rare type of cell with a nucleus and no cytoplasm in a large amount of extracellular material, or nuclei in a shared cytoplasm, that is, a syncytium, as occurs in fungi. In order to distinguish between these two possibilities, we took out pieces of tissue between the neurons from random parts of the nervous system and found them to be replete with mitochondria, showing up well with Janus Green, just of course as do the mitochondria in neurons. On the lower right, the mitochondria can be seen in neurons. On the left, they can be seen as clearly in neuroglia. The findings of electron microscopy are compatible with those of light microscopy. In this section, at relatively low magnification, there are two large neurons, here and here, with nuclei and cytoplasm, and two smaller spherical nuclei, not apparently surrounded by a cell membrane. Mitochondria are plentiful in the surrounding tissue. It has sometimes been argued that the neuroglia have cell membranes which cannot be seen by electron microscopy because the section has not been cut normal to the membrane. However, this explanation cannot be accepted because the membranes around the nucleus and mitochondria are so clearly seen along most of their lengths. One can say very little about the structure of naked nuclei since no one has succeeded in isolating them gently. In stained dehydrated section, they appear to have granular, non-uniform deposits, but no nucleoli. We have reassessed the evidence for the current views on neuroglia, and we are now in a position to reclassify the elements of the central nervous system. All cells with processes are neurons. They include what others have called astrocytes, the astrocytic processes being the axons and the dendrites. Some neurons do not shrink or stain as much as others, so they more closely resemble the larger, more spherical, freshly dissected neurons we saw before with hematoxylin and eosin staining. We do not agree with the widely held assumption that many cells have processes which do not stain. Therefore, apart from neurons and capillary cells, the only cellular elements are those which have no processes of the naked nuclei, which other authors name reactive astrocytes, oligodendrocytes or microglia. In part two of this program, which follows shortly, we shall be discussing synapses, and finally, we will summarize our views on the cellular structure of the brain. Sherrington, in the early 1890s, proposed that cells must communicate, and he suggested the physiological concept of synapses in order to interpret his experiments on reflexes. Very soon afterwards, Held, 
whose illustrations we see here, observed end feet, and these gradually became accepted as the sites for synaptic activity, whose properties have been described. They are also illustrated in this silver stain preparation of anterior horn cells, produced more than half a century after Held's drawings by Wyckoff and Young. These granules are said to be the synapses. Note the length of what must be presynaptic fibrils. We shall be returning to this point later. Synapses are also seen in electron microscopic preparations, which also involve the use of heavy metal salts. But there are several anomalies in the evidence produced from light and electron microscopy. Firstly, regarding the numbers of synapses. Each point on this diagram is plotted from figures quoted in authoritative publications and shows that by light microscopy, synapses appear in tens to hundreds on the surface of neuron bodies, while by electron microscopy, they appear in their thousands. Similarly, when we compare the figures quoted for the diameters of synapses by light and electron microscopy, there is again a large difference, as we can see from this diagram. The average sizes for light microscopy are usually above one micron. Those for electron microscopy, below. We now consider the actual appearance of synapses. These drawings by de Robertis summarize microscopists' findings. This is a common view by light microscopy, showing the synaptic cleft and the preterminal fiber. By electron microscopy, although it is rare to see anything of the preterminal fiber, we often see a clear view of the synaptic cleft with its characteristic pre- and post-synaptic thickenings. The cleft has a very consistent appearance in all specimens, with the elements quite specific distances apart. This is a model of a synapse. If we were to cut a medial longitudinal section and view it, as microscopists do, at right angles to the cut, the cleft would have this appearance. If we cut at another angle, and again view at right angles, we will see, relative to our first section, a much extended area of thickening, and the cleft will appear closed. It is obvious that the appearance and dimension of the cleft are going to change with the angle of the section. The lack of variety by electron microscopy is not consistent with the largely random orientation that these irregular three-dimensional objects will have to the microtome knife. It was well into the 1950s before Houdin succeeded in isolating unfixed neurons for examination. Such neurons have a granular appearance and some histologists have interpreted this as being due to synapses. But are the granules on the surface of the cell or are they in the cytoplasm? Here are two models of a cell. We have taken a thin section from each to show that the one on the left has granules on the surface and the other has granules in the cytoplasm. Viewed from above, the distribution of granules is different. Those on the surface appear fairly evenly distributed, while those in the cytoplasm are less numerous over the nucleus. When one examines whole neurons by low-power microscopy, where there is considerable depth of field, or looks at illustrations of living cells in tissue cultures in the literature, a list of whose authors is shown, one sees in every case that the granules appear less crowded over the nucleus. Therefore, one must conclude that they must be in the cytoplasm, and the appearance is probably due to mitochondria in which neurons are rich. So if these granules are in the cytoplasm, they cannot be synapses, since synapses by definition should be on the surface of neurons. What then of this granule seen in microscopic preparations stained or fixed with silver salts which we saw earlier? Certainly they appear on the surface of neurons, but we can also see many granules in the background between cell bodies. This is also the case in Held's drawings. This is a universal appearance by light microscopy. We list here authoritative publications which illustrate the granules sighted between and away from the neurons, sometimes as frequently as on the neurons themselves. This itself casts considerable doubt on the identification of these granules as synapses.
there is an even more serious objection to regarding these granules as synapses. Although there are many illustrations in the literature of neuromuscular junctions, where can we see any evidence of synaptic connections with other neurons? Looking at this drawing by de Robertis, we can see that the synaptic knobs are not attached to any preterminal fibers, dendrites, axons, or any other part of another cell body. The same is seen in Wyckoff and Young's micrograph. In some of the granules, short strands can be seen attached, and this shows that the thickness of such connections would be within the resolution of the light microscope. Indeed, in cerebral and cerebellar white matter, one can see fibers of the same diameters as these strands. This demonstrates clearly that connections with synapses could be seen if they were there. These drawings show what the neuron and preterminal synaptic connections would look like in plan and side views. Such connections are just not seen down the microscope or in the literature. It is of crucial importance that if synapses are to carry out the physiological function attributed to them, they must be connected to dendrites or somas of other neurons. In the light of these conclusions, let us look again at the structure of the different cells in the central nervous system. The neuron is thus a cell with processes, called axons or dendrites. Its soma has no synapse, boutons, knobs or end fossa on its surface. In life it is fairly spherical. The cytoplasm is a clear liquid of low viscosity with any mitochondria in it. There is no Golgi body endoplasmic reticulum or any lysosomes. The nucleus is imperforate. In unfixed neurons in normal saline, one can see a thick nucleolar membrane. The nucleolus contains a skein-like nucleolonema, which can be seen moving when the neurons are alive. The positions of the neurons, axons and dendrites in the nervous system are fixed in life due to their ramifications. The structure of the naked nuclei is simply that of a spherical ball containing a uniform clear nucleoplasm in which there are no nucleoli. They move slowly in a semi-liquid neuroglia, which is a syncytium rich in mitochondria. It contains capillaries and is aligned by ependable cells along the ventricles. This diagram is similar to the micrograph of Scholl, shown here, and of other authors such as von Economo, Campbell and Connell. We may conclude, firstly, that the central nervous system is composed of a comparatively small volume of neurons and their processes, in a much larger volume of syncytial ground substance or cytoplasm in which naked nuclei and mitochondria are interspersed. Astrocytes and oligodendroglia with processes are probably neurons. Secondly, the properties of the syncytial ground substance and of the neurons dominate the biochemical, biophysical, mechanical and pathological properties of the central nervous system in vivo and in vitro. It should be stressed that the syncytium described here is located between the neurons and the naked nuclei and is quite unlike previously reported syncytia, which were continuous with intracellular fibrils as seen in this picture of Bowers. Thirdly, excitability crosses the nervous system not by chemical transmission at synapses, but by electrical conduction from a neuron body down the dendrites and through the low resistance syncytium. This radical reappraisal of the cellular structure simplifies the explanation of a number of well-known properties of the mammalian central nervous system. The rapidity with which gliosis occurs after focal cerebral infections, the rapidity of spread and the malignancy of gliomata, the infrequency with which individual astrocytes oligodendrocytes and microglia can be identified and distinguished unequivocally in healthy tissue, the difficulty of separating and identifying pure fractions of these kinds of cells, the fact that edema seems to be mainly neuroglial, the softness of the living brain compared with other cellular tissues,
the low electrical impedance of the living brain, the fact that some patients with severe hydrocephalus and cerebral atrophy may have normal physiological and psychological behavior patterns, the high oxygen uptake of the brain and the spinal cord. The diminution and clarification of cell types in the normal central nervous system should simplify considerably the classification of pathological conditions, especially of tumors, arising in the brain and in the spinal cord.